zero. What's up, guys? It's Wes with Sin City Tactical, and welcome to the show with your co-host, as always, Jax, the Minnesota Overlander, and a big welcoming back to Griff. What's going on, man? How you doing? Doing well. Glad to be back. Definitely glad to have you back. Jax, Jax is just here. It's yeah, nice to have love you, you back. too. All right, let's jump right into it here. We're going to start off with tactical gear item reviews. And uh, let's let Mr. Griff go first. He uh, His first show back, glad to have him. And we'll let him take it away. All right. Well, I'm going to get a little advanced here and talk about an app for your phone. This app is called Osmond. That's capital O. SM capital A N D. Osmond is an offline map application that's available on your Amazon devices, your Google Play Store, and your Apple Store, whatever the heck they use. It has many plugins such as a contour and terrain plugin, nautical charts, and more. And now this isn't exactly a small lightweight app either for example the contour and terrain uses measurements from srtm the shuttle radar topography mission and the aster the advanced spaceborne thermal emission and reflection uh, <coughs> radiometer these instruments are on board terra a flagship nasa satellite in, that was built in conjunction with nasa and japan you have the ability to save map markers, profiles, routes, and more, and even transfer them to other devices through things such as SD cards and USB drives. The app is free, and if you were to buy all the plugins like I have, you only spend less than 20 bucks. What's nice is it gives you pinpoint accuracy down to your longitude, latitude, and minutes. Uh, for a more realistic example, we're talking like down to a single housing block. And what I'm using it for myself is just in case of like a grid down type scenario where I can still have my maps and routes online or on my phone with as accurate information as possible. And possibly my favorite feature is you can download entire state maps as one packet. So like for me, I have Minnesota and Wisconsin downloaded. So I could pull up a map equal up to, you know, down to the nearest gas station here in the metro. Or I can go all the way up to the boundary waters to where my family's from and get a route directly to the back porch of one of my family's houses. <clears throat> and you know, even the free version of the app is just nuts with the amount of capabilities it has. The only gripe I have about it is the interface is a little advanced to pick up right off the bat. So you can have to play around with it to get used to it. But many people have said this is very much the equivalent or civilian equivalent to what the military uses for their mapping programs. That's awesome. It looks like works totally offline, turn by turn voice guidance, uh, optional lane guidance, street name display, stuff like that. Map viewing, care, uh, carry highly detailed, fully offline maps, 
of any region. See, now that's nice because there's certain situations where if I go shooting out in the desert, you lose cell phone service. And right. if you get yourself too far into a situation and don't realize how you uh, got yourself into it, you may get stuck. That kind of leads to those scenarios that me and um, Jax talked about where, you know, what if a tire pops or something like that? If um, if I had to trek back on foot to go get help, this is definitely a, a nice tool to have, especially because it's one device. I'm not having to go out and buy a mini Garmin or something like that to uh, to keep on me. My cell phone charger still works, even if the tires popped on the truck. Uh, I'm pretty sure, at least I haven't had a situation where it hasn't. So you should be right. able to have offline maps with you for uh, quite some time. That's awesome, man. I like that. And I just opened up the app today when I was at work, and they made some more updates that they haven't listed on the website yet, which are things like, uh, you know, you click on local eatery, it'll pull up the Wikipedia page for the eatery. Or, yeah, this, please check your local laws. They even say it's the map. But they even list uh, popular speed trap areas. And they even do uh, real-time, up-to-date updates as well, if you want to go online with maps. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely going to have to check that out. Actually, I just downloaded it on my phone. So I'll definitely Super. be checking that out soon. Um, definitely a big ups. It's funny because I was talking to somebody literally like yesterday or the day before about topographical maps and um, the importance of them and stuff like that. And I, we were talking a little bit off um, off air here about uh, being able to get one of those plugins separately. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to have to pay a little bit for it, but you said yep. it's like 20 bucks for everything. Oh, that's yep. bad. And the thing I like about their topographical maps is not only do you have the classic graded lines, like on a flat map, it gives you uh, like a hot and cold color code, almost like a weather radar type deal, to show the intensity of how fast it inclines or declines. That's awesome. That is awesome, yeah. Because that's one thing you don't want. Uh, I mean, obviously, in, in Minnesota, I don't know if there's a bunch of uh, mountain cliff drop-offs. But at least out here in Vegas, there is. Um, on the outskirts, there's mountains that you can literally... Well, we're very close to the Grand Canyon. I'll use right. that for an example. You don't want to be lost somewhere and walking towards the Grand Canyon and not know that you're not making it to the other side. Because that could uh, be a life or death Dude, we're thing if you go trekking that far. We're in Minnesota, the Mississippi cut right through St. Paul, and we have bluffs everywhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Same type of deal. Yep. So you definitely don't want uh, that, especially if you're off on your own or if you and one other person getting lost and you go to trek and now you're two days into something and you're trying to go get help. You're, mm -hmm. There's somebody back there waiting for you, and you come across something that you now cannot cross, and your energy spent. You don't have food and everything else. That could be death for a lot of people and we definitely don't want to see that so no. it's awesome man. thank you for that information definitely uh, check that out o-s-m-a-n-d maps um it is on android on google play and uh amazon too it looks like it's a amazon available app as well yep. so, and awesome. i downloaded it on my phone too so it looks like all three of us are running it um yep. like i talked to both of you guys online before offline before the show that we were gonna definitely me and you anyways griff meet up face to face do the transfer of the plot points you got but i will also be downloading a map of the state of nevada in and of itself in case you know wherever down there with wes and one thing leads to another and we're kind of just wandering around in the back 40s without any physical map. Right. Tell me about it. You know, we grew up in the winter tundra. We're not built for the desert. <laughs> right. And, and I guess very similar on this end, of course, uh, a lot of my family comes from Wisconsin. So I get, I've got some cold blood in me, but uh, I'm not built for that. It's like a, a quick little short story here. When I was building waterfalls for a company I worked for, 
um, they sent me to Florida. Well, I'm a desert rat, so humidity is like not a thing out here. If it's over like 20%, it feels like you're dying out here, kind of. You know, oh, it just man. depends. But you go from the point I'm making, the extreme of like no humidity to 97% humidity, and it's like, oh my God, what just happened? You know, it's a totally different world at that point. So, um, yeah, having these type of maps is definitely something that can save you in, in the long run. But, all right. So, so, Mr. Jax, we're going to let you take away your tactical gear item. Well, actually, my tactical gear item is going to appear in the CLS training segment. However, I can tell you I have updated and completely swapped out something that is attached to my EDC bag. So just expect to see a little bit more gear coming, as well as here in the coming weeks, uh, that replacement item that broke on me a few shows back. And uh, coming Monday, I do have some more tactical gear coming in the mail as well. So we'll move forward to Wes's tactical mm -hmm. gear item, and then come CLS training, you guys will have the pleasure of seeing mine. Awesome. Give me one second. Get this reset up here. Okay, so I went into my tactical toolbox of like builder's kit, range kit, stuff like that. Um, so over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to pull out individual items from the toolkit and go over each one specifically. So a lot of people come into the gun shop to get their sights um, um, sighted in, I guess, for lack of a better term. And uh, one of the items that I had got is a laser bore sighter. So what you do is you put this in the end of your barrel. So let's see. Turn it on. That will go pinpoint from your barrel. So then onto a wall or something. You can measure out how far the distance is from where the tip of the laser is going to be to your gun, and you can sight it in that way. So what's cool is this kit comes with these little rubber pieces with a screw on the end that attaches to the end of the bore sighter, and what you do is you just tighten it until it grabs on the inside of the barrel and holds it snug so it doesn't move out of alignment. And then when you're going to sight in your scope and or red dot or anything like that, you literally just adjust your red dot or your hash marks on your um, scope to meet where that red laser is. And you can sight in your own firearms without having to take it to a gun store or to a gunsmith to get your gun sighted in. Or if you like doing things the hard way, you can try to use your eyes and just sight it in while you're out shooting. Of course, that's not going to be 100% accurate. Um, this was something that you can get for like 30, 40 bucks on Amazon. Allows you to get your weapons um, to be a lot more effective. So as you see above me, the 9mm AR-15 that I have there is my self-defense slash um, home defense gun. It accepts Glock magazines. They're in there right now is a 33 round stick mag that I'm able to run hollow point through. And you can see there's a red dot on it and a magnifier and lights and lasers and all that cool stuff. But what's nice about it is when I use my bore cider, I can literally measure from, could I have a, I have a, a funnel of death at my house where my bedroom door literally is the end of the hallway on one end and the complete opposite end straight hallway is the front door. So I can literally stand at the deepest part of my bedroom with the door open, use my, bore cider to pinpoint the a specific spot on the front door and be dialed in so i'm not going to have a situation of where i'm you know off by a couple of inches or off by a foot and now i'm putting rounds out the front door and uh, other places so it allows me to be more accurate when it comes to the home defense situation uh, we're going to address this right now because Jack seems to think he's funny, and I see him grinning. He's laughing at me, as you guys know. Uh, the beard's gone, okay? Yeah. I see him smirking off in the corner of the screen. Um, yes, we're not talking about why I don't currently have a beard. We're not getting into that. <laughs> Anyways, make a long story short. Uh, laser bore cider. They're 30 40 bucks on Amazon. 
Um, they come with different tips, so you can go from 22 all the way up to your bigger rounds, 308, 3030, stuff like that, and sight in your rifles and pistols and stuff if you put red dots on them. So laser bore cider, check that out. You and know, I do want to <laughs> – go ahead, Jax. I was going to say, you know, that's awesome. I've done my fair share of uh, laser bore sighting as well, but more along the lines of uh, cruiser weapons in the Army, so like the 50 cal uh, is a little different. It has a different, you know, system that it runs, but the uh, 249 saw and the 240 Bravo, I've used similar systems to, uh, yep, but... The one that they're running actually is a little bit of a bit wider uh, oval front and for the laser. So, absolutely, Griff, you were going to say something. I was going to say I I love my bore siders and as a personal personally and college trained gunsmith, I do bore siding uh, semi frequently in my private life. But I do have to say, stay away from the chamber bore siders. A little like two two threes with a built-in laser module you put inside your chamber. Yeah, they work great once or twice. Then your extractor will start chewing them up, and eventually, you'll have a part you can't use anymore. Those things cost like fifty, sixty bucks. Just spend the chunk of change, get yourself a good regular bore cider. Yeah, not to mention that a lot of those ones that looks like a casing of a round, like he's talking about, um, if you accidentally pull the trigger, you're pretty much going to break your laser bore cider. Um, I've seen that happen a couple times. Oh. Not to mention, too, if you're running a standard A2 birdcage on the end of your firearm, um, if your laser isn't dialed in perfectly coming out of that barrel, you're going to get shadows on... Um, whatever object you're pointing the laser at, they're just not as effective as sticking something through the end of the barrel that's not being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Obstructed. It's not having a conflict with whatever muzzle device you have. So it allows you to use your linear compensators and your A2 bird cages and uh, the VG6 um, type of muzzle devices and not have problems, even suppressors. Um, right. You can you know, sight your, your firearm in without having to rely on a laser that's coming out of the center of the, the actual upper. Um, right. I would rather you spend your money and get something like that than the little casing uh, lasers like Griff was talking about. So, okay. Let's move right into the CLS training then. So then Jax can show his tactical gear item. Indeed. All right. So obviously, you know, week to week, I kind of bust Wes's balls. Uh, not as much in the last couple of weeks, but, you know. You can't now after you break your own equipment on live stream. That was, that was quite good. Yeah. I missed it. Very thoroughly. You know, that's okay. You can't give me shit then when I got to reshave my face to go get my cat card uh, done up. No, I'm still going to give you shit, but that's okay. Well, okay. Then everybody <laughs> watching, go ahead and feel free to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, leave a comment telling me uh, not to ever shave my beard again. Oh, he he finally gets it. <laughs> right. So oh, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Um, what's 5150? What's going on, man? How you doing? Uh, nice to have you on the show and watching. Greatly appreciated it. Uh, let's see. Ken Davenport also commented in, you shaved your beard. you no longer allowed to make fun of my toupee. All right. Yeah, I won't make fun of your toupee anymore. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, matter of fact, too, there was one more comment. Uh from I'm about to have an answer for that right now. Go into your CLS training, and I will do that. Perfect. So, for starters, obviously, I kind of went through all of what was in my old IFAC, but I went out and figured I needed something more. 
you know, it, for what was in the I, the original IFAC, it was worth the money, but this one is a lot better deal and roughly the same price. I got way more in this than I did in the other one. And actually, I had so much in this one, I had to split it between the two. So if uh, my co-worker Bob ends up tuning in and watching this, you know, I, I hope you enjoy the old IFAC. Now, with the new one, this is a Everett Survival Kit. You can find them on Amazon. They're 42 or 43 bucks. But like my other one, just coming with the medical patch, this one actually came with a more deployment style uh, American flight patch which is awesome. Uh, it still has the Velcro backing, so I can attach it to the Molly uh, tie-down that attaches to my EDC bag, as well as having the rip-away handles for both pulling it off of that head and for opening up the actual IFAC in and of itself. It has the flip tab there uh, with your nylon meshing and when i say this one came with a lot more than the old one i mean that i, I however did you know split things up this one came with uh adhesive medical tape another cpr mask some uh triangular bandage examination gloves now i went ahead and uh Threw in some hand sanitizer, obviously, with the coop going around still. You know, you got to have some of that. Threw in that splint roll. And then I went ahead and threw my cat in there. I'm going to have more of these on the way as well as uh, some holsters for those. Uh, let's see. Griff said something. We'll use some medical tape. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, Griff, that's a good question, brother. I do not know why it looks like a rolled up uh, rubber, but it's in a plastic ceiling and it's just a small roll of tape. Now, also comes with two smaller rolls of elastic gauze bandage. I know before you say anything, Griff, they look like tampons. Um, that's beside the point. Never besides the point. <laughs> first. Well, well, I haven't even day, gotten into the best part yourself. yet. <laughs> so then you got your soap wipe, your antiseptic wipe, insect sting relief wipe. But you got two of those. And, you know, it's, it's actually weird that it only came with four uh, anti-sting wipes. And I split that right down the middle, but it did come with a crap load of alcohol prep pads, which is kind of nice. Sterilize and clean wounds and all that other good stuff. So I'm going to save that part for last because I already know what you're going to say, Griff. Adhesive uh, wound dressings. So there's a bunch of different size adhesive wound dressings in this bag you got your absorbing cotton balls some more gauze dressing which is kind of nice that it's all sterilized and in a bag itself your trauma shears we touched base on these in the old ifac another tactical flashlight on a smaller scale but it still has your three main modes high low and what i like to call seizure mode fire starter i don't know why that got put in there always nice to have that though also came with a extra which i gave my old lady the new one but came with one of those multi-tool cards that I've previously shown in a previous episode. Yes, on-site cremation. Griff, you're right about that. 
Now, they came with the smaller pair of tweezers, which I would assume would be to pull out, you know, the stinger from a bee, whatever the case may be, or even to remove splinters. Came with a nice little glow stick. Actually, two of them, but, of course, split things down the middle. I only really needed the one big one because down the road I'm going to be getting the uh, Marcos, which uh, down the road me and Griff will talk about. Cotton swabs, always got to have that. Emergency thermal blanket. Up here in Minnesota, these are nice to have in the wintertime in case your car breaks down. Now, this would be probably more something along your lines. Uh, emergency poncho down in Nevada. And I'm sure it rains a lot, so having to spare one of those is always nice. Now, with that being said, all that gear, this is roughly all the room I had to fit all that in, plus I still got more on the way. So I'm going to have to rearrange some things to make it fit. But that's, that's the new IFX, so that's my technical gear item. I've got the carabiner on it. And then just to bust Wes's balls here, um, before I put all this back in the IFX, I'm going to go ahead and pull out good old CLS book here. Oh, God. While you're oh, doing that, I am going to... Uh, bring up something real quick i had a customer oh, come into the oh, shop oh before you bring that up i forget one alibi bitch stickers pardon my french <laughs> so nice little uh boo-boo kit assorted bandage sizes so there's that too sweet um okay so one Garcia came into the shop earlier today when I was there, and uh, he has a CZ-75. Took uh, him and his wife out to go shooting for the first time. Brand new ammo, not reloads, and came across a squib load when his wife was shooting. Um, and, of course, it scared him. So he came into the shop to ask some questions, which is 100% the right thing to do. And fortunately enough, he was smart enough to go, hey, that didn't sound right. Do not pull the trigger again. Took the gun apart, found that there was a bullet jammed inside of his barrel. Um, so he came into the shop and was asking questions. And uh, the reason why I'm throwing this in the CLS training is because this is something that could happen to anybody and everybody at any time, regardless if it's new ammo and or reload ammo. It most commonly happens with reloaded ammo. Um, especially when people do the reloads themselves. Uh, but what happened was the bullet got stuck. Then they had a squib load situation. It was a, a different noise, different sounds happen when you have a squib load. Um, so he came into the shop with the firearm. He uh, took the gun apart while they were out shooting and fortunately enough got the, the bullet out, but then you know decided, okay, uh, we're done shooting this. We need to find out what's going on and came in to find out if it was his gun or the ammo. Um, we looked at it a little bit, and it didn't look like there was anything wrong with the gun or the feed ramp on the barrel or anything like that, but it, uh, it's a real scenario. Uh, we looked at some pictures while we were in the store. We were showing him, you know, other situations where squib loads can be extremely dangerous, you know, especially if it's coming out of a, an AR-styled platform or even a pistol. There was a, a picture of a Smith & Wesson revolver that had six squib loads um, back to back to back. And they cut open the barrel to see what was going on. Obviously, the gun was rendered uh, non-usable anymore. And uh, it, it's a scary thing. If you have a squib load that happens and you don't catch it, it, uh, it could definitely blow up in your hands and take off some fingers and, and other things. So... Shout out to uh, to Juan for being smart and realizing, hey, let me not continue to keep shooting this and let me go ask somebody who might know more information about it. We concluded that the ammo itself would have been the cause for his particular situation. Um, and of course, we told him, you know, maybe you try another one solid round 
of that take it apart check and see make sure that you know you're not one stuck in the chamber or if you're just not comfortable with it then get rid of that ammo completely it's not something that you want to play around with me personally with that situation depending on how many rounds there are and the current world economic state uh ammo is not cheap at least here down in nevada it's not cheap so i i'm not too reluctant to go throw it away but um I might try one or two more rounds out of the batch, and if it's okay, then I can do that. Uh, but if you're just not sure, then I would say just get rid of it. It's not something that you want to risk uh, limbs and life over. Uh, and one of the guys in the shop um, that works there, a coworker of mine, that uh, one of his buddies worked at an indoor range or something along the lines of that, and they had a gun do a squib load. Now the guy that was shooting the firearm didn't get hurt when it blew out the side of the barrel, but, uh, he did, he took shrapnel to the face, um, because he was standing behind his back left shoulder while they were uh, letting somebody shoot a rental gun or something like that. So it, it's definitely a scenario that is terrifying, um, in every situation, but it's something that needs to be looked at. So especially when you're running a semi-automatic firearm, you want to listen and count rounds and stuff like that. I always recommend counting how many rounds you have. That's a good practice for home defense too. Helps keep you calm, helps keep breathing going. And you don't run out of bullets in the event that you're in a, in a firefight. You kind of know where you're at. But um, listening to the sound of the gun makes a difference too because there's sometimes where you're shooting an AR and you'll get a fireball out the end and that'll be a little bit more of a different sound. A squib though is... is a definite difference in sound and if, if you don't address that sound when it happens it could turn into a very dangerous situation so thank you for coming to the shop and bringing that up greatly appreciate that um, and yes absolutely it's awesome that, that you know people have the the common sense to go hey let me go ask somebody who might know more than me it's uh sometimes embarrassing, you know, and, and I'm glad that you weren't embarrassed to come in and ask those questions. Not everybody knows everything and to be able to come into the shop and ask those questions the way that you did. I commend you for that. Cause there's a lot of people who might just blow it off and, and have a, something bad happen. So shout out to you. And I do want to add into that Wes. I'm not sure if I've told this to you guys on the podcast, but I'm a USPSA match director which is a run gun action pistol. And my season usually runs from April until August every week. So on average, we get one or two squibs that occur a year. And just like you were saying, Wes, it is a very distinctive sound. You know, if you want to get 60 people to yell stop all at the same time, have your gun go bang, bang, pop. Yeah. And it really is. It's a very distinct pop. Almost like popping a champagne cork. Absolutely. And uh, to, to that point as well, it's, uh, it's a situation where it, could, it can get very, very dangerous. You know what I mean? And to, to have the acknowledgement that there was something wrong with your gun is, uh, is a huge thing. You could have, you know, had a much, much, much severe situation happen with that. Um, what was I going to say about the squib load situation? I don't know. When I when I think about it, I'll, I'll bring it back up, but we're going to let Jax get into his CLS book. Yeah, and I, I'm just going to quick touch on uh, squib load and then move on to busting your balls. So um, as far as the squib loads go, again, I will agree with you, Griff. It is a very distinct sound. I was doing some research, too, and looking into the difference between uh, squib loads, um, misfires, as well as, um, shit, what was it? <sighs> squib fires, misfires, and then... Cue the Jeopardy music. <laughs> right. Um, for lack of a better term right now, late, late fires. Hang fire. Yep, hang fire. There you go. That's that's the exact term that I was looking for. 
Uh, and there's definitely a difference between all three of them. And squibbleloads, like you, you said, it's a distinct popping like a cork on you know a bottle of champagne. And usually, depending on the kind of gun you get or you are shooting at that time, if it's a semi-auto, hopefully, you know, it doesn't lock your slide up. But if you're shooting a revolver, you know, which I don't know what kind of gun he brought in or was asking you about. It was a CZ-75. Okay. It's a semi-auto. Yeah. Yeah. But in the case of a revolver, if the squib load doesn't go all the way into the barrel, it can lock up your cylinder and be, you know, I mean, in, in a way makes a gun safer if it's a double action. So if you are to pull the trigger, the cylinder is not spinning and firing off another round. But knowing the difference between the two is the difference between not only A, life or death, but B, completely destroying your firearm. Now and I remember to, what I was going to say. Um, go ahead. I was just going to say, it. I like what what 5150 just said. It's like the backfire of a car. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Um, so in, in Juan's particular case, and this goes to anybody who's watching right now, this is a big reason when you're purchasing a firearm to not go cheap. And the reason why I say that is the particular firearm that he purchased was, a, once again, a CZ-75. It's uh, real big in the gun community. Um, they directly made the CZ-P10F to compete with Glocks in competitions and stuff. So they're, they're pretty big on the competition circuit. And and what I was going to say is there is only three companies in the world that manufacture guns that use a cold... Um, hammer forged barrel um, on their firearms CZ FN and I forget the other one off the top of my head but they cold hammer forge their own barrels which makes them a lot more durable they're a lot stronger they last longer it's better quality some um, companies will get their barrels um, imported from a different company or they have it subcontracted out but buying a firearm that is good quality not only is it going to be better when it comes to trigger and mechanics and things like that, it's also going to give you better quality in the event that something like this happens. If he was using like a high point, it probably would have blew up in his hand or in his wife's hand for that matter. And that's that's just not okay. Right. And just to quickly touch on how CZ was competing with Glock when it comes to competitions from what I've seen in the competition community, you know, not talking about the custom bell $2,000 race guns, just solely out of the box guns. CZ is winning that battle or winning that competition. I see way more CZs than anything else and kind of jealous. I don't own one myself. Yeah. I want a P 10 F. We got uh, two different P 10 Fs in the shop. We've got the um, OD green, slot or grip excuse me frame with the black slide and then the all black um model as well and those out of the box come with uh tritium night sights they come with an enhanced trigger stock and they come with like two or three 19 round magazines where if you look at like the glock 17 or something like that um you're going to end up doing trigger you're going to end up taking those sights off uh i don't really know anybody who likes the the u sight on the uh, Glock. So you're going to end yeah. up doing sights, trigger, pins, polishing connectors, and trigger bars, and and all this stuff just to get it right. So you're spending $600 or something like that pre-COVID price on a Glock. Then you're dropping 150 on a trigger, 150 on sights, 70 to 80 bucks to polish the trigger and connector bar, and, yep. and you know, all this stuff. Um, to, to make the gun competition worthy as to where the CZs, especially the P10Fs, are coming out of the factory basically competition ready and at a better quality um, as the, the Glock after you modified it. Not to right. mention Glock has gone up about a hundred and something dollars in price during COVID and CZ has not gone up at all in price. Right. 
but before we go off on tangent about Glock versus CZ, we should probably continue on with the show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, indeed. So, perfect question to bust your balls there, Wes. What should the following statements is true? Most soldiers who died from combat injuries on the battlefield could have or could not have been saved by self aid, buddy aid, or combat lifesaver efforts is answer A or answer B. Almost all combat deaths on the battlefield could have been prevented by using self aid, buddy aid, or combat lifesaver efforts. I'd probably say most combat injuries could have been prevented from being fatal if treatment was given in a uh, reasonable amount of time um, leaving a, obviously leaving a wound untreated for any length amount of time could be deadly you can get athlete's foot and not treat it and mess your feet up extremely bad you know what i mean so i i would say b would be the correct answer um, I would say A would be the, the non-correct answer if if I had to go off of logic and uh, common sense, I guess. And going off of logic and common sense was right. I, I would have went with the harder one, Maybe. but I don't think you know what the uh, ISO 871 is. No idea. Okay, so <laughs> it's probably going to start with that, the question number one. We'll, we'll go into another question uh, next Saturday, CLS episode, uh, from the actual book. So we'll keep the we'll keep the ball rolling with the show here. All right. So the next topic um, that we have. All right. This this question keeps popping up in the comments, so I'm just going to address it now. Okay. What happened to my face? Great, here we go. So what happened to my face? I was trimming the beard, trying to get it more slim-lined to not look like a Duck Dynasty Griff over there. Um, you know, too much. My beard wasn't long enough for that. Uh, hey, man, it's winter Minnesota. Here. It's all about survival. Yes, I had some tangles down in this area, trying to get it all sorted out and... Uh, I didn't like the way that it was going, so I decided to uh, start anew. Hopefully that answers your question, Rob. Not going on about the beard anymore past that point. Okay, great. Uh, moving into the next segment, <laughs> Pro 2A News. So this is a, a big thing, especially with the ATF withdrawing their notice on pistol braces and things like that. Um, I've been a supporter of SB Tactical, as you can see behind me. SBA three. Um, I have a couple of SBA threes, but now you're starting to see shockwave um, blades on some of the firearms that I have behind me. And the reason for that is uh, SBA submitted a firearm, an actual firearm to the ATF to be looked at and to have it um, determined if it was an SBR or not based off of their exact rifle. Okay, so it was a very basic AR-15 Magpul flip-up sights, 11 and a half inch barrel with an SBA-3, and that was pretty much it. There wasn't any swapped out triggers. We're talking your PSA standard AR with just an SBA-3. They submitted that back in either March or May of 2020 before the whole ATF trying to pull pistol braces off the shelves and stuff like that happened, SBA tact or SB tactical got a letter back from the ATF stating that they had determined it wasn't a final notice. So it wasn't put into law, but from what they sent back to SB tactical is that they considered this exact rifle that you see above me. Cause that's 11 and a half inch barrel. Standard AR with an SBA-3 is technically considered to them to be an SBR. So SB Tactical knew ahead of time that something that they submitted was not compliant with NFA and ATF rules and guidelines. And they still continued to sell these products in shops and basically said that they are NFA compliant which is simply not the case. Now, 
once again, I'm not your babysitter. You're going to do what you want to do. I'm not a uh, lawyer either, so I'm not giving you legal advice. Uh, clearly, I have one on one of my firearms right now. Um, I just wish that a company that I've invested quite some money into, because those SBA 3s range about 140 to 150 bucks to get, and it's just the brace and the buffer tube. It doesn't even come with all the extra crap that you need to actually make the gun function for 150 bucks that they uh, would be a little bit more transparent, especially if they, uh, they got a letter from the lawmaking group saying, hey, we consider this an SBR. And to continue to push forward and uh, say, and here's the bad part. The owner of SB Tactical went on to do a bunch of interviews and stuff, and I, I'm not going to get into all just because I don't want to make the show too long. But they went into the uh, interviews and things like that and said, oh, no, I had no idea that um, the ATF was going after pistol braces that he didn't find out about the whole situation until three or four days later. And they were saying that they didn't know that their products weren't going to pass the ATF guidelines and NFA guidelines and things like that. And clearly that's simply not true. It's not true in the fact that they got a letter back in March and this all happened within the past month and a half. So to say that you didn't know and to continue to market and sell your product without informing your consumers that, hey, look, this is going to be an item that could potentially, keyword potentially, become an NFA problem um, is, is just wrong. I don't, I don't like supporting companies that are going to, uh, you know, give me false information, especially if I'm putting trust in your product going, okay, I'm trying to do everything legally and the lawful way and go, all right, I can legally make my firearm an 11 half inch barrel with this brace without having to do federal tax stamps and things like that and form ones and everything else. But to then find out later, hey, I spent 150 bucks and I still may have to do a form one is very misleading and, I, and I'm not too happy about that situation. So uh, me personally, I probably will not be buying any more SB um, braces and I've come to the conclusion now because I have a gun trust um, set up and I have beneficiaries and um, trustees uh, which Griff we haven't talked recently you're also listed on my trust as a beneficiary for a particular firearm in the event that anything ever happens to me so uh, we'll talk about that a little bit offline but um, yeah so I'm going to end up just form wanting my guns and making them SBRs and, and just not dealing with the headache because I feel yeah. misleaded from a company that was supposed to be making a product to, to keep me legal without that process. So uh, not very much faith in, in pistol brace companies anymore for me, at least. Yeah. You know, and if I may interject on that, I, I don't disagree with you in that aspect. Um, you know, obviously we've kind of covered all the SBR stuff, including way back in, season one before Griff's hiatus. So it's just kind of funny to me that, you know, the ATF was going to try and put forth a ban on everything and then decide to pull out of that. Now that kind of makes me think, well, what are their future plans going to be with the whole SBR situation? I right. think, I think Griff has got a statement he wants to make. So I'm going to let him, speak his piece and then i'm going to add to what you just said Jax. well mainly i've just been nodding along in agreement and all i have to say is more of a blanket term and some cya and kind of like what what's 150 uh, 5150 is saying about our rights not being infringed personally i am a diehard constitutionalist me as well i i'm not a man of faith, but to me, the Constitution is my Bible. I read it every day. I carry it with me everywhere. So, you all can probably guess my thoughts and opinions of this entire situation, at which point I have a raging hate boner against the ATF. Yeah. Me as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things when... Uh, when we talk about 
what about our rights shall not be infringed upon? Um, and that that's the big fight right now is what is constitutional and what's not. Here's my fear and why I said that doing the gun trust and yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, I'm not putting that comment into the live stream for everyone to see. So uh, good try. The issue that I have is that with the current election going the way that it is, and and I was going to do the Pro 2A section on, you know, um, how, do, how do I tread lightly here without getting us kicked off of YouTube? Uh, uh, you shut up. That's out. Capitol <laughs> building. Okay, storming Capitol building. I was going to talk about that. I yep. think there's been enough about that going on. And uh, if there's another question about my beard... Great. Uh, Don't worry about the beard. It's an illusion. Yeah. It, it'll be back in a week, uh, at least, hopefully. So, anyways, storming the Capitol building. I was going to talk about it, but there's plenty of YouTube channels that have already put out content on it. And it, if you're under a rock and don't know what, you know, has transpired with that, then I, I'm sorry. Uh, quick little synopsis of it. A lot of people stormed the Capitol trying to portray themselves as uh, MAGA supporters or Trump supporters. There was evidence that was shown saying that if, you know, there was people from like Antifa, NFAC, things like that, that were behind it and they were identified by wearing their hats backwards and they obviously tried to pin it on certain situations. That is all speculation. None of that is factual to my knowledge. I'm just speaking off of the conspiracy theory uh, side of things of, of what happened because I believe in true hard facts. So we're just not going to talk, talk about that too much, but the shall not be infringed upon. Uh, yes, that's the biggest problem. So to answer kind of what Jax was saying about how the ATF withdrew their notice and they're backing down and things like that is because they posted a form through the ATF.gov website for the consumer, me, you, Griff, and anyone else to comment on that bill that they were trying to pass or to put into place. And a lot of people were against it and commented on how it is infringing upon our constitution. Um, once again, I've said this before on, on multiple shows that uh, the first amendment is only valid when it's protected by the second. If our second amendment rights are taken from us, the First Amendment rights will shortly fall thereafter, and uh, then we're in a dictatorship and no longer a democracy, which means welcome to uh, Hitler, uh, Hitler Germany is basically what's going to end up happening, and, and I'm 100% against that. Now, I will say this, and I think Griffin and Jax will agree with me. Now, Jax being prior military and, and Griff with his uh, you know genius brain of, of engineering and things like that. Yeah, there we go with the cross-eyed. Um, would agree with me on the fact that I truly believe that if there was a civil war situation because of the storm in the Capitol and all those things, do you truly believe that our soldiers are going to come home and try to go against our rights? I, I just don't believe that there's enough soldiers that would fight for the left um, and especially they're severely outnumbered when it comes to that, you know, half of our troops are deployed at this point, a lot more civilians with firearms and without. And uh, it, I think it's unjust to say that because your views and your opinions don't line up with mine that I have to give up my rights for it. Right. And I do want to quickly dial it back a little bit to a screen cap I saved from the uh, submit your comment that the ATF did. And I think whoever this anonymous person was, and for once I'm not covering my own ass, this is some anonymous person, not me. This person wrote, to all agents and employees of the ATF, everyone hates you. Your wife, your children, your parents, your siblings, your cousins, your stripper. Everyone. And I think we can all share that. Yeah. It's uh, it's sad that the it feels like people just don't see what's going on, that they're trying to take over 
Uh, perfect example. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. Is this not what the CIA does when they inject our soldiers into foreign countries to then take over and change their government? Do we not first start with physical control and then restricting laws and regulations and then eventually interjecting our government uh, policies? That's exactly how the CIA takes over other countries. Look at Iraq. Look at Kuwait. Look at uh, all these different countries that we've gone to. This is exactly how the CIA would take over another country to then impose our government policies on a foreign country. And now they're doing it here at home. Yeah, and you know something, uh, I'll speak on this now. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I agree with you. I did six years in the Army, as most of our listeners and viewers know by now. Um, you know, we've, we've come a long way in the last five months, so it's awesome that we're here and we're kind of on this topic in a weird, roundabout, sick way. But there's definitely no way if I were still in today and serving overseas that I would come home and just be okay with, the government telling me, oh, yep, now you guys got a uh, deployment mission here stateside to go and take away everybody's Second Amendment right. I'll tell you this, at that rate, I'd, I'd look at my uh, company commander, the battalion commander, and I'd tell them, look, you guys can chapter me out with a dishonorable discharge. I don't care what you do, but uh, if that's not happening. Well, Jax, doesn't that go against the oath you took as a a soldier when you first enlisted? Yeah, you know, I mean, in, in a weird kind of roundabout way, yeah, but on the same well, side of that. Well, no, what, what I mean is that I'm not familiar with it. I was never enlisted myself. But doesn't your oath cover upholding the Constitution and protecting American citizens? Well, that's what I was just going to touch on. It, it would for me to basically tell the president and the government no, but or but then again on the no side of things it wouldn't because in that same oath you know you're supposed to hold up the constitutional rights and defend the united states of america against enemies both foreign and domestic so that's kind of where that right. fine if gray line right, is the as the pro to a community being the domestic terrorists then you're stuck between a rock and a hard place and yeah. uh, for me, I know I know where I would stand. I wouldn't stand on gunning down my fellow Americans that did things legally in the right way. And this all goes back down to gun control, where you're taking guns away from me. I'm not the problem. The criminals who got their guns illegally filed off serial numbers or purchased a burner gun. That is your problem. That is not me. I've done well, classes and certifications and registered my gun and purchased them legally and did private party transfers legally and did all of the right steps to make sure that I abided by the laws. But you're going to punish me, the citizen that's doing what I'm supposed to do per the rules, and you're rewarding the gangbangers who have guns illegally. How is well, that? You know, it's, well, this is just our version of Reagan's uh, war on drugs. You know, that worked out so well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a topic for another day. And uh, we're, we're pushing the show a little bit longer than normal right now. So we'll probably dive into this a little bit more on either Thursday or next Saturday's show. Uh, we do have some time constraints uh, that we have to uphold to. I've got some stuff that i got to take care of personal. Um, outside of the show. Um, so we're going to do our shout outs and sponsors real quick. Um, big shout out to Controlled Pair Munitions, the gun store that allows me to work there and uh, bring a lot of the gun videos and stuff like that that I have been recently to you guys. So big shout out to them. 7350 West Cheyenne Avenue, Suite 106, open seven days a week. So come check that out. Another shout out to Wendy from Sight Shooter. She is a Patreon supporter of the channel. She helps bring a lot of this content to you guys by helping us financially. 
Um, you can make donations through Patreon, or you can go to the anchor.fm for Sin City Tactical and or Minnesota Overlanders. Same with their Patreon and make a um, financial do- donation to keep bringing good content to you guys. And then uh, last shout out, Tac Pack. Um, use my code SC Tactical to receive a free mystery grab bag. Um, it is extra content. I do remember when Griff got his mystery grab bag. It wasn't the best thing ever, but it was extra items that you don't have to pay for. So that's always right. Fun. You want to go, Griff? Yeah, or you want me to? yeah sure, I'll go. Uh, I'm just going to shout out one person, and as always, I'm going to shout out G3 Survival at g3survival.com. In my opinion, he makes the finest firearms leather work in the entire business, and I've personally been working more and more with him. I'm bringing forth not only new products, such as chamber flags that we're currently working on, but also personally designed by me Leather wraps for your pistols, your rifles, and forends, and what have you. And just for a little sneak peek, it's not up on the store yet. We're still tweaking the design. But the first design we'll be releasing under our name is going to be the Betsy Ross wrap. When you say our name, what's, what's our name? What are you referring At, to? As in... Once this is released, y'all can go on to g3survival.com, find the Ross wrap, and right in the description, it will say, personally designed by Griff from Minnesota Overlanders and Cincy's Tactical on it. That's awesome. Indeed. That is extremely awesome. I'm glad uh, to have that going. Hopefully, we're going to try to work with G3 and see if we can't get a... Uh, a promo code for you guys for even a short time to to be able to purchase some wraps, but that's going to be an offline uh, behind the scenes, you know, kind of like your NFL players. You see them play on Sundays, but you don't see the work that's done in between. So right. we, we do a lot of work in the, uh, the off screen side of things to try to bring you guys as much stuff as possible. So hopefully we can get something like that in the works. Indeed. All right. So to start my end of the shout outs out again, Wendy from Sight Shooter, we had her on last Saturday's episode, had a lot of awesome questions answered. I know I shouted her out on uh, Thursday night show, but again, a big thanks to her for joining us. Um, it'll be kind of cool to uh, see um, a lot more from her in future showings, as well as possibly when all this COVID stuff clears up, all four of us getting together and actually doing, you know, either a video shoot or meet and greet and things of that nature. Uh, however, I do want to shout out TACX Pro Gear. You, using the code Overlander25, you can get 15% off your purchases at ncca.com, which is National Carry Conceal Association.com. And you have to type the whole word out because NCCA will not work. Uh, so you, you have to type out the entire name of the brand. Otherwise, going to tacxprogear.com, the same code, Overlander25, will get you 25% off your purchases there. Um, last but not least, I know the shirt's kind of been out of screen all show, but I'm going to go ahead and shout out our brother Wes from Sin City Tactical, the Minnesota Overlander shirt that Wes Griff has on. And you see me wearing on Thursday and the good old Sin City Tactical Banner shirt that I'm wearing right now is a lovely Christmas present from yours truly, Wes from Sin City Tactical. Plus, there is a Sin City Tactical hat in the works coming my way here in the coming next couple of weeks, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. So... All right, we're going to wrap everything up. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm going to leave you guys with a personal private message this time. I know uh, Griff got thrown into the fire with a positive message about an hour before he uh, knew that that was going to happen. So uh, shout out to Reno May. This is going to be uh, a quote from him. He is a YouTuber, a gun tuber, I guess I would say. And the biggest thing I could say is protect your rights, protect yourself, 
Stay safe. Stay dangerous. Peace out. Later.